Hello, everyone, and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Europe, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals across the continent. I'm Jean Marc Lima, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning in into this half year special broadcasting series. Today, we will explore data sovereignty, AI, and sustainability, and how all this is reshaping Europe's data center landscape. Our panelists will address crucial topics, including the changing dynamics of data sovereignty, the influence of AI, and the imperative for sustainability in the European data center sector. They will also explore strategies to prepare for this new wave of deployment, examine financing considerations, and analyze the regulatory landscape shaping the future of data centers. And with that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup, which includes Peter Miles, Client Director for Virtual Data Centers, Chris Miller, Chief Revenue Officer for Power Harvest Infrastructure, Emma Fryer, Director of Public Policy for Europe at Cyrus One, and Rhys Jones, Director of Engineering for IFRA Partners. Um, guys, well, thank you so much for making the time to come on online and speak to us. Um, I think before we jump into the questions, if you could just do a bit of brief um, elevator pitch of what each business does uh, and what, sort of what your role is within the business, that will just give some context to our viewers. Um, I'm going to go in the order that I see people on my screen. So, Chris, let's start with you. Uh, hello, yes, I'm Chris Miller. I'm co-founder and CRO of Power Harvest Infrastructure Fee. We're developing data center infrastructure um, based around renewable or carbon neutral energy, uh, starting with our first site in the northwest of England. Um, we're saying, well, information is power, knowledge is power, power is power, and preferably carbon neutral power. And, and that's where we're focused. And power is really the oil of this industry, um, and hopefully green oil, green power, sustainable power. Um, and then, Pete, that was not the best acronym I've made. <laughs> Pete. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, Pete Miles, uh, client director and one of the founding members of uh, Virtus Data Centres, uh, one of the largest data centres operators uh, in in the UK, centred uh, fundamentally in London and a bit further out, uh, and recently uh, ventured into to Europe and doubled our footprint. So broadly, about six hundred megawatts of capacity, uh, delivering to uh, a plethora of clients. Um, uh, across 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 Europe, and uh, delighted to discuss um, uh, the topics today. So thank you. And continue to expand across the world, um, <laughs> backers as well. <laughs> um, and then Emma, you've also got very interesting backers, Emma. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Emma Fryer. I'm Public Policy Director Europe for Cyrus One, and we're a large co-location provider. <clears throat> we're actually headquartered in the States, but we've got a, a significant European footprint across. Uh, seven markets um which we're expanding so we've got a fairly significant development pipeline as well and uh reese hi i'm reese jones engineering director for it for partners um we're relatively new in the market we have a modular data center offering and we're currently deploying a couple of projects um and we have some standard ai um, designs available and also a very interesting pipeline in the making. So we'll, we'll be watching the next 24 months and see what comes to Absolutely. market. Absolutely. Um, so guys, I mean, I think we were having a chat just off camera uh, just before we jumped on this. And I thought it was very interesting and very quickly we got into many different angles and different topics um, that are quite important for what's happening in the industry. So I'm gonna launch one question and I'm sure we're gonna just divulge from here uh, into many different topics. So when we look into data sovereignty, AI and sustainability, how do you think this is all changing the data center um, in Europe? Um, how, I mean, what are the power constraints? What are the challenges, the opportunities? Um, let, let's paint the picture of what's happening and then we'll dive down into more specifics. Um, so I'll see who wants to go first. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. I, I, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, when you're talking about AI, uh, you're talking about data sovereignty, really, Ultimately, what, what you're talking about from, from our perspective is demand and, you know, huge demand, um, an avalanche of demand, frankly, um, which is coming in different guises. Obviously, data sovereignty by definition is, is, a, is, is about locality, um, you know, within region, within, within country. Um, uh, and that poses different uh, dif different challenges and requirements and, and ai of course is changing the the way um, we look at things from a, uh, a a site selection perspective the the limitations on latency uh, are, are less um are less important so so we're venturing into to the mega sites you know whether 200 to 500 kilo uh, megawatt requirement um as opposed to 
uh, the, the smaller, more more metro requirements. So, uh, you know, ultimately, it's keeping up with the demand. Uh, and, and as we're aware, there's you know, very significant constraints on, on, on the power infrastructure across across the whole of Europe. And beyond, and uh, and that's you know that that's what we're all trying to um, that's what we're all trying to combat. Uh, Chris, uh, don't know your view on that. I think the interesting thing is the interdependency of those three factors. So if you think about you know data sovereignty in the UK, for instance, there's a strong commitment from DSIT, the Department for Science, Innovation, Technology, that sort of own this this policy portfolio for the free free movement of data. So they will only apply you know rules to keep data in country to that that data that you know is specifically required to remain there like you know health data um, military data um, but other nation states may not see it the same way so you may actually see then the workloads moving to where they can be delivered with um, cheap renewables or you may not so I'm finding that really interesting of course that then immediately links into sustainability so I think the whole all three things Linked. are interconnected and interdependent and, and and that's i suppose how i see it it's an interesting one emma because looking at the eu um, ai act it will apply to foreign entities who are providing within the, the union um, and those companies will have to have a resident in in union located representative so um <clears throat> Yeah, I, I mean, the, the notion of being able to deploy wherever you can get the, the most cheap energy, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to avoid regulatory oversight. You can right. never so, avoid yeah. regulatory oversight if you're in the EU. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. obviously, but, but if, you're, if you're... Very proactive. If, 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 if you're a US-based, if you're a US-based technology company who has put something in Alaska, shall, shall we mm -hmm. say, and um, the the equipment that's doing the the processing for for the AI product is in Alaska, but the end use is in EU, then the AI Act will apply to that organisation, um, or I believe that the, the the union will just prevent access to it. Yeah, I think there's there's a degree of protectionism with data sovereignty, isn't there? Um, I think there's certain mm. governments have woken up how important digital infrastructure is, and obviously it's this avalanche of AI, and they're kind of protecting their own uh, economies, really. Um, and I think so. There's going to be a. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of self-regulation, and I kind of use the three three-legged stool analogy for most of the stuff that we do. There's the laws of physics. You know, can we physically do this with the power? Then there's regulation and there's commercial. And I think the leg, the regulation and commercial is sort of impacting. The power is the, the key thing out of all of this, right, for me. You know, you've got to go where there, where there is power. Um, and then you've got to try and navigate around the commercial and the regulation in order to make that power position properly commercialized. Um, so there, there is a bit of, I think, you know, from a, <clears throat> a regulatory point of view, uh, I think governments are using that data sovereignty to, to protect their market, really. Um, and, uh, you know, there's clever ways of using digital uh, uh, technology, software and so on to make it anonymous. Um, so I think Emma mentioned about sort of military and health and so on. There's going to be certain applications of uh, of data sovereignty that will will absolutely mean it has to be in country or in region for those. But I think the vast majority of applications, um, you can be quite clever in the way that you code uh, and, and make it sort of uh, anonymous and, and cyber proof it, it, cyber proofing. No, it's it's the it's, it is interesting <laughs> so, so it's like mili um, under the EU Act, um, military and sort of science research and development will be um, exempt. Uh, and uh, I mean, as I understand it, in getting an agreement on the Act, um, it was sort of sort of dual um, dual parties: EU Parliament and the Council of the EU, and. It, was apparently very, very contentious, sort of like balancing economic op opportunities versus public interest without stifling innovation. Um, you, you know, so it, it is very, very, it is very challenging. Do you think there's a chance that there'll be tension in the sense of lack of harmonization? Because we're seeing in the US a more, perhaps not, laissez-faire is perhaps not the right word, but a, a relatively 
relaxed approach to legislating around AI because they want AI to grow and flourish and then they want to yeah. look at it in retrospect rather than constrain the directions it might take or artificially constrict the market. Whereas Europe's taken this risk-based approach, so the, the more risky they view the AI, the stricter the rules on it. And do you think there's an mm. inevitable, I'm asking your question probably, Joe, but it, do you think there's an inevitable collision um, and, and there'll be a lack of harmonisation? What's what's really interesting, though, Emma, is apparently it was stated that the um, the EU were hoping for what they're terming a Brussels defect, and as much as them being sort of the first, um, you know, sort of above or regional entity to adopt an AI regulation, they sort of figured well, they would become the exemplar, and it would encourage other com countries or regions to take a similar approach. Um, I suspect you know the points you've raised will be really quite dependent on what happens in the next presidential election as well. Point. Singapore's following the European lead apparently. Yeah. Oh, hey. Well, let's face that it, regulation kind of, kind of is, is, a long way, is a long way behind technology innovation, isn't it? It always mm -hmm. has been, always will be. Um, so I think, you know, Emma, it's kind of where your role is at Cyrus One, I guess, is that you've got to be a, thinking ahead of the curve of what regulation is going to impact what you're doing now. Um, so, you know, there, there's, I, I don't get too too hung up on, on regulation until when until they start bringing things where you can, you know, go to jail. And those sort of things are happening. And, and of course, uh, the US is much more laissez-faire about it, apart from the Patriot Act, because, um, you know, there's, yeah, there's not much... You US government data outside of the US but when it comes to everyone else they've got they've got we've got stuff in US companies stuff somewhere haven't we um, and I think that's what the EU is trying to, to untangle a little bit and they've done very well on that in other forms of legislation like CSRD the the, the, the tendrils yeah. of EU, EU legislation are now stretching way way beyond the borders of the EU and in a way that's good because it means you can't kick cans down the road and push stuff outside I think you know you can see that as some of those legislative instruments being the sort of end of greenwashing but they're very heavy lifts very very heavy lifts to comply in terms of you know compliance costs and, and, and burdens um but uh, just in it's certainly interesting for me to see these two different views and then you've got the uk trying to harmonize everything through the um sort of initiating the ai safety institute i think it is and hosting the ai summit so i think their approach is maximum possible harmonization but i just see the i'm just wondering how these three different attitudes i think eu and eu and uk are pretty aligned but i'm i don't i think the states has got a slightly different attitude It'd be really interesting to see but legislation is always behind the curve you know, the issue for us is that we tend to agree with the objectives, but not necessarily how we're going to get there. Um, I, th I think the other thing that's quite difficult, really, when you look at it practically, Emma, is, you know, looking at the taxonomy of, um, you know, actors with, under the AI Act, um, how data centre owner operators would actually be you know responsible to do something um, because it seems to be very much about you know provider deployer authorized representative importer operator and then on the other side an affected person um, but if you are hosting um, <clears throat> somebody that is um, providing an AI platform it doesn't really seem particularly clear currently on what your responsibilities mm. are. I mean, inference suggests that if it's a, um, you know, classified high risk AI um, per the EU directive, then if there is a safety implication, then there may be some requirements around cyber security and physical security. Um, and then as you go down, similarly, requirements for physical security. But, you know, what that actually means to people currently building data centers right now is, is difficult to say, you know, and you like Peter's GDPR? already alluded you, you, in GDPR, you had a similar thing that if you were just providing yeah. the infrastructure, there were only certain yeah. things you could influence yeah. in terms of the data that was contained therein. You weren't the controller, yeah. you weren't even the processor, really, but you could actually affect whether that data was available. You know, you did have that. Absol uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, um, there were these levels of responsibility and i wonder if it will learn from gdpr which i think in the end people did manage to pass out um where they sat in that particular stack um i so mean it been. seems it seems that um a lot of the way that the eu ai act has gone has been um built upon principles of gdpr 
um, there, there seems to be, you know, uh, fairly strong alignment in the in the paradigm adopted. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm no I'm no lawyer. I'm an electrical engineer. You know, I'm just interested in in what the implications are for what it, it means for us and the business that we're in. Um, so I've done a little bit of research on it. But yeah, it's it is a it is a tricky one. Um, you know, and again, how. Um, you would be fined or sanctioned by what will ultimately be the AI office is is difficult to understand. Whereas if you are the the platform providing um, the AI, you know, I, I mean, if you put a prohibited AI system on the market, um, the fines are apparently seven percent of your annual worldwide turnover, which is um, for you know the big players is going to be a bit eye watering. Just make sure you've got better lawyers than the uh, the regulators, which is nine times out of ten the, the truth. <laughs> mm. I mean, but that's, we, we spoil for choice now when it comes to, to legal advice in our industry because uh, every law house is investing heavily uh, in bringing talent into the space. Uh, before we go into, I mean, you guys raised a lot of important topics and I've got quite a few follow thing, uh, things to follow up on. Uh, just a quick geographic question because we were talking about you follow the power to build infrastructure. Um, it's all about power. This is where the Nordics are doing well. This is where some of the Southern European countries might do well. When we look into secondary markets, and as we follow the power into those markets, do you see regulation and legislation impacting their potential in the future? Could, could that hinder um, the development of new markets at the end of the day, or we are able to just navigate it all? Um, is, I mean, also, I, I believe we are talking mostly about EU and UK, so we're not really talking about countries outside of EU at this stage. Um, I suspect, um, Gerald, that that will depend entirely on, um, you know, availability and cost of power and how sustainable it is. Um, because it, potentially, if, if you could get a um, large connection and the cost of energy was attractive, um, as long as it met with your sustainability reporting obligations and, and it wasn't horrendous or you know it could it could work i think people sort of are forgetting that with um ai deploying either sort of immersion cooling or direct liquid cooling and the temperatures that are involved the opportunities for realizing free cooling it suddenly opens up um you know global regions that previously would never have been an option for for free cooling with, with an air solution um, but with a d direct liquid cooling solution, you you may actually realise a, a good portion of the year with um, compressorless cooling. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's true and fine. I, I think, of course, the reality is um, that accounts for you know one part of a market. AI is you know where we're talking yeah. about there. But back to something like data sovereignty, there's the technical that that would be more a, 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 call it standard inverted commas uh, called deployment. It doesn't have the same um, burden of of, of um, power. I mean, if you're doing a, a 124 kilowatt NVIDIA rack, liquid cooling, fantastic. But there's still a huge requirement for um, you know, what would be more air cooled um, deployments. And I think that is the challenge that, uh, you know, operators have in being able to develop um, a flexible solution that can cater for it all. Um, but as we all know, you can't be all things to all men and, and flexibility equals greater cost. Uh, and sometimes the more the more the more bespoke you are the more sustainable you can be uh, as well so i, I think you've yeah, we've got to look at it you know ai has become this big focus but actually you know it's just part of a big part of it for the for yeah. the immediate future anyway and i think that's that's the way we view it and i think our clients are viewing it as well they're trying to hedge um so that they can capture um, yeah, I think there's the, the 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 AI piece. I mean, it's obviously it's relatively new as a as a term, and I'm still kind of you know I think you'll probably get 57 different descriptions of what it means depending on who you talk to. But I think we can all agree that the density of 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 the power is is increasing, regardless of whether it's cloud, whether it's uh, 
uh, AI focused. You know, it, it's it's increasing anyway. And I think that there's some really basic things. Um, you know, so I did a uh, a project in China and we did it as an OCP compliant data center and just some really basic things about the physical infrastructure to make sure that the floor loadings were as high as you could possibly get them because there's new these new racks are heavy. Uh, liquids heavier than than air. Um, you know, so you're going to have to start thinking about that. The, the you know, and, and things like lifts. You know, make sure you've got massive lifts, uh, elevators for the Americas, right? You know, it's just really basic stuff. But it goes back to again power, because uh, you know, you, unless you have the power, the re-engineering is kind of irrelevant. If you really, you know, it's it's how much power you get, and and it's how much work you can get. And we talked about the PUE in this industry, right? Um, which was kind of interesting that it was formed by the, the IT companies, really, apart from APC. And the villain was the M M MEP, not the IT. Mm. Uh, that was the villain. It's like, what's the energy efficiency of the IT? So I think we're going to get to a position Don't start now me where, on that, Chris. <laughs> no, no, we're going to get to a position where it's, it's, it's how, how efficient are you per kilowatt? How much bang for buck can you get for, per kilowatt? And then, you know, feeding back to uh, how, how uh, um, uh, carbon neutral, how energy efficient and, and how green that energy is and it, and it all comes down to let's be honest the only interest that we've had in our industry for many many years the only interest of green is the green back right yeah. it's, it's, you know how much it's about the commercial side of things so uh, and i i use the term the dilemma we're in in society is the end of the month versus the end of the world um and so you know we've got to make decisions now um because the demands now i'm trying to make sure that you know so we talk about our business that the end of the month it's got to be grid connected day one but the end of the world is do you have a narrative to go carbon neutral uh, on that project over time and that's kind of where we're at um, and i think the other thing we've got to be conscious of in our industry is that we're becoming very public um, you know, data centers, if you mentioned a data center to someone 15 years ago, even in our industry, they go, what's that? <laughs> it's a computer room. Um, but, you know, it's becoming quite, you know, visual. Uh, and we've got to be very careful about, you know, how much power we're taking off everybody else and what the benefit of that power is. And so we use the term ethically powered data, not ethical data. That's a different, uh, you know, kettle of fish. But we've got to make sure that as an industry, we're doing the right things to self-regulate because it's coming. We're going to start getting punished and going to, going to be taxed. Yeah. We are. It's, 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 you can, you yeah, can understand it. Pardon? Yeah. Sorry. Um. Well, I was, I was going to say, I mean, you can un you can understand it if you sort of look at a sort of quasi-economic term, you know, derived social utility. If you look at um, how many jobs you get in a data centre that covers however many acres versus how many jobs you might get in a data centre, um, you know, that's built in the same space versus how much energy it uses and makes unavailable for other industries versus how much water it uses. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not sure how aware Peter is with sort of some of the local concerns around the facility that Virtus have acquired in, in Saunderton, you know. Um, it, that has been an interesting experience living not far from there to see the social response to people who don't really understand data centers and they, they you know they, they they think it's horrendous that they're going to be living next door to a data center and personally i'd say it's probably you know an ideal neighbor yeah um, you, right. know, you know it, it, it <laughs> relatively relatively low staffing levels you know um you're probably only really going to hear it when there's a power cut um uh, you, you know social perception is is, is quite quite difficult yeah. in that regard I, 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 t I totally agree, and and you know that's there's an you know there's an education um, that you know we continue everyone you know in the industry continues yeah. to do. I mean these things aren't helped when you get really badly uh, um, BBC um, uh, oh, I, I, I documentaries guess. about data centres yeah. that are misleading. Uh, but but one thing I would say is actually within an industry, I say I think we do we do ourselves a disservice. I think we've actually done remarkable work and are actually way ahead um of of those who are others who are in the digital economy you know you talk about pue you talk about wue uh, you know i, I think we're my I, I do think we're, we're a lot further ahead i think what perhaps we haven't done well because it's kind of just the industry's gone under the radar is is um publicize what we've you know what we've done and, and the strides we've made i mean to your point about the green, um, Chris, you know, back when PUE became a thing, um, you remember that 
basically businesses were fixing their PUE um, uh, and you know taking a view on whether they lost power in reality because it's a function they didn't want to have a high PUE because that meant a higher power cost etc cetera, etc cetera. now when you're delivering um, a day center that's you know eight ten twelve megawatts like they were 12 years ago 10 years ago yeah perhaps you can take a view on that and because utilization of power was not particularly high back then when you're delivering a hundred megawatt data center and the utilization is you know 80 90 percent um it's a it's a surefire way to end your your business if you if you take that view which is why you know pretty much the standard now is to have tiered um PUE settings as you go higher in utilization because you know it's it is it is the client um and the end user who needs to be um feeling that pain and that pain yeah no I, I, I'm not I'm not anti PUE um, um, no 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 PUE is just one example it's just a, it's, it's a measuring example. metric that at least we're measuring right exactly yeah. exactly and, and actually WUE has really actually become more of a uh, more of an issue, you know, in, in, in certain areas where water is a big concern. But then I think it's really up. important to consider, though, as well. I, I mean, you kind of wrap that under the banner of green, Peter. And, and you know, when we talk about green, you know, we, we tend to sort of talk about PUE, which is really a <clears throat> energy efficiency matrix. Um, you, you know, sorry, metric, rather. Um, you know, people will say, you know, our we're sustainable we've got a 1.2 PUE well I mean to my mind sustainability means something quite different you know and looking at the demand challenges with AI it kind of begs the question as to why we're not looking at you know whether or not um, the ITE providers can look at you know using different types of power supplies it would make sense in terms of how much copper we're throwing into buildings um you know assuming that ups providers followed suit to run at 690 volts um you know there's also similar challenges you know if you are doing an incredibly dense um, ai deployment just how how you get the power around um, you know you could be potentially looking at 4000 amp plus primary buzz bars with 1250 amp plus overhead buzz bars to serve um, <clears throat> to serve cabinets which causes some challenges again because it's in a relatively sh short um, short cabinet row you know are you even going to have enough tap off connections on the buzz bar to serve the number of cabinets that you need um, you know the commando sockets top out at 125 amps um, you know I'm, I'm sort of minded although it's not realistic um i think that joe carver was misquoted as as suggesting that there was a one megawatt rack that he had seen i think he came back and said oh, i've seen a roadmap from a, a vendor to potentially mm -hmm. one megawatt i mean just think of how difficult it would be to to run the run and distribute the power um you know and similarly in terms of the industry you know we tend to now have moved very much away from two end type deployments and in infrastructure to distributed redundant which gives us some options for dual corded equipment but what's to say that ai equipment isn't going to be treble corded um you know again it four corded changes it slightly um and there's certainly a, a lot of ite that is has four for power supplies just because of the need but um you know how do you balance load and realize resilient power if you've got three power supplies which yeah and it, well i think and it, 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 you know it's a very very valid point and and even when you look at generation and generators you know in, in Vustermark, um we are you know which is sort of 300 um megawatts incoming you know our end game there is to uh, if not you know to be generator free now how realistic that is uh, we will see but that's certainly the intention um, um well does, doesn't that depend on a risk for risk profile though peter because yeah, of course it does you know of course it does. You, you, you do you do an availability study on you know most um national grids um likelihood is is you could probably go generator free in Europe with um, two two connections that are derived from separate 
bulk bulk service points yep. um, in in terms of availability. Uh, yeah, and that's but, that's that's the mind that's a mindset thing though, because I mean you're agree, actually yeah. right. There's certain locations. It's yeah. the you know the customer's king, and uh, you know yeah. a lot of people say that our market's very it's very innovative as long as the innovation's ten years old, right? Um, and <laughs> yeah. I think that um, you know from our customer's perspective, you know latencies changing. It, I, th I think you've got to understand what the actual application, what the what's the stuff doing in the data center. You know, uh, it, does it need to be six nines, five nines? You know, there's certain stuff that actually it doesn't. It just if it if it's on it, it let's you know put it on. So I think there's a change of this AI as well. That you've got the uh, generative, you know, the actual making the machine learning stuff, and then you've got the inferences of, of yeah. how it's uh, delivered. So you know, you, you might find actually, well, you know, from a, a machine learning point of view, well, we're just going to put it on when we've got cheap renewable energy. That's it. Yeah. Um, and we'll and we'll develop we'll we'll develop infrastructure that's N. It's not you know we only got one yeah. sun by the way just so everyone knows that so we're on an, an N system. But you know it might be that we don't need you know two uh, uh, N and 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 it's, you know there's there's going to be different applications for different places depending on where the power's available and depending on what the actual requirement of of the the work that's being done in that data center is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, that's a really good point, Chris. And it kind of brings me back to a great presentation that I saw done some time ago by Ed Ansett, where he was talking about service line architecture in the data center, you know, and why is it that you build a data center with two end facility for a financial institution because they're hosting trading platforms, but they're also sticking email for the back email. office in that yeah, data yeah. center. And, you know, do you actually need that level of, of resilience? Um, you know, you look at those data centers as well. I mean, in terms of their utilization, I would suggest that a lot of those sort of older enterprise data centers are typically below 50% utilized, you know, in much of, much of the same way that the sort of, um, depending on the use case and hyperscales have changed things, but I suspect Peter would, would agree that for sort of a lot of wholesale co-location and certainly retail co-location, you know, the utilization factors are actually quite low. Yes, 100%. And, and, and that's where the shift is to um, the likes of AI deployments. And, and, you know, the hyperscalers are much more sophisticated and, you know, are getting much more and they're sweating the asset as i said you know they can't, you know can't you sort of you know also look at hyperscalers as possibly le needing less resilience if their you know avail availability zone type model works you know because again as long as it's not latency dependent and as sort of a user of say 365 um other other software is available um you know if you lose access um or, or you see a pause for sort of one to two seconds is that really going to be a problem for you as long as you don't lose the data I, I, yeah I, I mean I, I think these are all valid theories uh, and again it's 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 the end user who ultimately um will define whether that one second is you know acceptable or not and uh um it's not a problem for me per se but but you know it, it, again yeah. it's again what who is what is the person at the end of the service um and what are they delivering and what do they need and and yeah i, I mean there's lots of improvements that can be made but where ai is concerned you are talking about you know it's on or it's off um and yeah. on goes you know yeah, and I think that, you know, we, we, we talked about AI as a lump sum, but lump term. I mean, you know, we, we're going to have to use AI within our industry, aren't we? Uh, to, uh, and how, how, how it operates the actual infrastructure that, that we're developing, because, you know, you, the, the sort of the follow the sun mentality. Well, you could follow the power, couldn't you? Um, uh, you know, that's something that, that can happen on certain applications, just go where the power is available at that time. And that's where that work gets done. Um, but you know, we've also got to, you know, put our heads on and think, okay, from an investor's point of view, um, you know, these, uh, the AI, let's go, we need a hundred megawatts and, uh, it's like, okay, well, this stuff costs a lot of money to build, right? Uh, and the more dense it gets and liquid cooling and so on, it, it's the capex is becoming considerable, uh, you know, per kilowatt, uh, even more than it used to be. Um, uh, and so trying to work out how that works and then and then you've got uh, what's your customer 
And all this AI stuff is like, well, okay, if it's the hyperscalers, great. But everyone else that's coming into the arena, it's like, well, they're not credit worthy, are they? No. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like, well, we want 10 megawatts. It's like, yes, you know, for a 15 year contract, but you, you've got no credit. So it's how do we, it's how are we going to facilitate this boom physically? That's the yeah. thing to me. Like, I, was, I was actually going to ask as well, bringing the, the finance investment um, conversation to the topic. I mean, we were having this discussion before we came on camera as well. We we're talking about who's going to pay for this. Um, I guess I'll, I'll put that question back to you guys. Who's going to pay for this? And I think beyond the capex as well is the opex. Uh, it's maintaining the facilities because we, I mean, we read headlines about company A is going to invest 10 billion, company C, company B uh, is going to invest 15 billion, but that's just to build. Um, those, those numbers usually don't include the opex that comes with it for the next five, 10, 20 years. How, that that, that begs a really, really interesting question, though, because, uh, I mean, back in the day, um, you know, there was reference to the technology facility paradox in as much, you know, we are probably on a seven year <laughs> refresh on, you know, IT equipment and we are building data centers that have last 20 years, um, seen much more now that data center companies are happy to amortize over sort of 10 to 15, but with AI, infra i mean what is the technology refresh rate going to be i mean i've I've heard values as low as 18 months suggested yeah um, I, I i kind of think on that one though it, it's it, I, I use the t the sort of um, um, analogy of of, of you know, rail stock it's like well you know the the, the reality bites nvidia et al um yeah you can make this stuff that's so any you know data hungry and half the size a quarter of the size and 10 times the the output where are you going to put it um, so you yeah. know they're going to have to start, they're, you know they're going to they're going to have to put the trains on the gauge rails that we're putting in there, and we're trying to be as flexible as possible in the infrastructure position, right? Um, but you know I think there's some reality bites, and I think that you know uh, we're all kind of getting to the point now. Okay, you're probably going to have to have uh, uh, some kind of chilled liquid, chilled water system in your facility. That's the flexibility to do whatever comes down the pipe going forward. But yeah, this, I, I, this, this I, I, talk to another issue, though, Chris, you know, in as much as I don't think there is alignment, I don't think people necessarily know where where they are, let alone where they're going. You know, I, I mean, if I said to somebody, OK, give me a typical flow and return temperature for a primary circuit feeding a CDU. So a, a CDU is a cooling distribution unit that feeds a rack manifold for, for, for direct liquid cooling. Um, you know, I mean, the values vary enormously. Um, I. As I understand it, there are key players within the AI sector who are still currently in discussions with ASHRAE currently about where this should be, you know, and obviously if it's 30 degrees C, you know, that opens up a lot of opportunities for, for free cooling. If it's 40 degrees, even more, but, you know, it really begs the question, it, would it be responsible to be doing direct liquid cooling with, you know, six and 10 chilled water temperatures? Uh, I mean, I don't think data center operators are running chilled water circuits at that anymore anyway, but, you know, this, that is another figure that I've seen suggested as a requirement for the, the primary on a CDU. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm agnostic to it all, to be honest, yeah. whether it's liquid air and, uh, you know, it's whatever, it's whatever works. And I think it, it, the, the pinch point comes back to, again, it is the power. You've got to have power, right? And that gives you yeah. the, power, the power gives you the flexibility, but you've got to then, uh, it, it, the, 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 it's how much you invest uh, mm. and how do you get the returns on that investment? Yeah, I just on that, I mean, I, I, I don't think liquid to liquid, liquid to chip cool. I mean, there's nothing new there. Right, you know, we, no, no. We've, we've got deployments in our data centers. Uh, you know, you call in AI, but you know, HPC, you know, you, you're yeah. delivering, you know, high density, high performance compute. Oh, just, just liquid... anecdotally, Peter, or, or, I mean, Cray started it, you know, it, it, exactly that, <laughs> exactly yeah. that. Um, and, and it, as I said, we've got large deployments, I say large deployments, physically small deployments, but very power intensive deployments. And it was done through our standard design with, with the tap offs um, uh, and then sort of a bespoke requirement. What's what we're talking about now is that this is just becoming you're having to standardize something which we don't quite know the something. Um, and it's just on a scale that, that is, is way beyond what we've ever seen before. But I don't think there's anything particularly new about, about delivering I, 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 that. I agree, Peter. I mean, going back to something earlier that 
Chris said, you know, about laws of physics. I mean, ultimately, at some point, you will reach a point sure. in terms of rack density where it is just not possible to cool it with air. Um, you know, an, another huge frustration that I find with our industry, you know, is we don't talk you know, to people closely linked to our industry particularly well. You know, I mean, we talk about regulation. Um, when was the last time, if you've ever seen it, that, you know, you had a law firm um, presenting at, you know, a data centre conference? When was the last time that you saw um, a processor manufacturer talking about, well, in real terms, this is the TDP roadmap for the processes that we're deploying, let alone, you know, let's just park GPUs at, at, at the moment, and then giving an informed decision, sorry, an informed narrative on where the inflection point is that you really need to go from air to water and then possibly saying you know well actually how how could we build ITE that is going to allow the maximum efficiency with the constraints on the on, on the facility because let's face it you know the big issue here is well if you let the silicon go too hot the server's gonna self-protect and shut down which is a little bit of an issue in a production environment um, I haven't seen anybody sort of challenging anyone from, you know, Intel, AMD, et al, saying, well, I, I, okay, what are the actual physic, physical constraints on how hot you could run these things? You know, is there a way that you could build this slightly different so that it may take up a little bit more space, but we could run it hotter and it be a better, better selection for, you know, sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, I will just maybe put one more question to the table because uh, we were running into the, the last five minutes i mean actually picking up on what chris said to him about looking forward uh, i think that'll be a nice way to kind of bring everything around we we have an year which is extremely busy on the election front we have uh, we will have a new uk prime minister we're going to have a new french prime minister I mean, you name a country there's an election uh, and europe is shifting a little bit towards the extreme sides of the scales um, which means probably regulation is going to change fairly in the next four years so when you guys look ahead, do you see any potential headwinds? Are you worried about anything? Could anything hinder everything we've just discussed? A lot of it is unknown as well. I, I, I put my hand up. But when you look ahead, what, what do you see? I think the problems are in the P's. We talked about power, planning, permitting, policy, which is regulation, and also just you know perception. Perception we talked about, um, and obviously the people to do it. So I think... In terms of regulation, the EU has just sort of churned out the most expansive and um, ambitious set of sort of sustainability based regulation I've ever seen. So I think they may be taking a breath and embedding that. So, for instance, just in the, in the um, <coughs> excuse me, the EED, um, which is really a data gathering exercise. Um, and then the next stage of EED is what they do with that data gathering, what that, with that data. <coughs> I've got a frog in my throat, so I'll hand over to someone else to pick that up. Will I cough? <laughs> Who would like to sit down? Well, I, I mean, from you slightly touched on it there, um, Emma. Actually, people um, recruitment is is that you know I think a huge, a huge challenge um, now. I mean, we're already seeing um, challenges in the market now, but as we look forward to building out, you know. 100, 200 megawatt data centers. Having the talent there um, uh, is 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 key. And um, you know, I'm not saying data centers have got to the point of being sexy yet, um, but but they're set, but they're certainly um, got much more. People are aware of their importance and all the applications and socially and. Um, uh, professionally they use that they get it now so i think it should be a, 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 an easier time to kind of really push um that element as an industry um uh, you know it, because i think that is is is, is a problem on a headwind uh, that, that that we see um uh and we're trying to you know do our bit and, and locally with schools and, and we do lots of work there in, in you know in, in the areas of our data centers and there's huge enthusiasm from from um you know the guys who come the guys and gals who uh who, who come to the data center um and it is a bit of a light bulb moment for them when they come 
come on. And actually, when you explain to them, you know, the opportunity to travel, to uh, to grow, and you've got a whole spread of um, opportunity, um, technically uh, and and otherwise. Um, you know, it's very, uh, it's a great opportunity, but there's a huge amount of work to be done because, um, uh, yeah, as I said, that, that, that's, there's limited resources at the moment. Uh, and I couldn't agree more because I think there's a perception that there's only sort of one or two jobs in data centres. I mean, we asked kids a while ago in some schools outreach, and you know, who what kind of jobs in data centres? And they said, oh, database management, which actually isn't a job in a data centre. <laughs> yeah. And we sort of presented the range of jobs and they were absolutely oh. astonished. And and also just making that link, which I think we, we need to keep doing. I know we've done it, we've done it again, we've done it again and again. Hmm. But I still think um, most people fail to connect their smartphones with the industrial scale infrastructure that makes yeah. it work. Yeah. And that it's in the cloud. It's in the cloud. Cloud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, look, I think going back to the question about the, the government piece. I think the UK we're UK based at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's been a huge change in. Uh, I think there's a bit of stability from an investor's point of view, um, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I think permitting, planning, uh, if they can start, you know, streamlining that a little bit, linking data center infrastructure, digital infrastructure with renewable energy, uh, clean energy. I think that's an important thing, and that links into the talent piece. I think we've got a fantastic opportunity in the UK and Western Europe to, uh, you know, utilize, you know, this growth of data center infrastructure that's required to be the catalyst to bring localized renewable energy to be the power to that and linking those two things together and educating the educators, the, the UK government and local authorities that these are the skill sets that we need. Um, you know, from electrical engineering to, you know, welding to, you know, there, there's a whole variety uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of jobs that, 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 that our, in, our industry is, is starting to produce. So I think it's an exciting time for the UK and Western Europe. And AI, I think the big push for that, the money that's being pushed into it, we should start thinking about how we can use that in the best way uh, locally as well. Both, both main party manifestos mentioned AI and the Labour Party manifesto mentioned data centres specifically mm -hmm. and that's the first time that's ever happened so i do think that's exciting and it's just a case i think the, the real challenge for us is to make sure we work with the policy makers help keep them informed you know rather than hiding behind our high fences and um, it's all about i think engagement to make sure that they actually understand what we're doing yes um, going going back to power availability i mean does anybody think that at some point we will get to a place where we really need to look at demand limitation you know, and we'll start hearing about, you know, responsible digital consumption. Yeah, I think so. That's possible. Probable. Yeah. Um, I think that I think that uh, players that have, and I'll go back to the thing I said earlier on, self-regulation, I think self-governance. Mm -hmm. um, if you start doing the right things as a business, you're going to dictate policy and you're going to make yourself commercially attractive by doing so. So um, I think that, you know, I talk about ethically powered data. I still don't want to go anywhere near ethical data, right? So I think that you know we've got to be very careful about um, uh, uh, how far we go down and deep into how we use power and, and what it's for. But I do think it's going I to guess get regulated. the question question of ethically powered data, though, Chris, is an interesting one because you know ethically powered may not be economically viable. Yeah, no. That, well, I think I, 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 I'm carbon neutral, right? I think that uh, if you look at solar yeah. and wind, it's uh, it's uh, it's more. It, it looks like currently it's it's more efficient commercially uh, than than fossil fuels, right? Uh, you look yeah. at nuclear, small modular reactors. I, you know, I'm a big fan of those. It's going to take some time to happen, but they give a base yeah. load. It's carbon neutral, uh, and they look yeah. commercially attractive. So, um, I, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about from an ethical point yeah. of view: is, is non-fossil fuel. And, and that was actually a big discussion at um, the, the World Economic Forum, I think in 2022, um, around how, how costly it is to be green um, or to bring all this down. And then at the end of the day, the conclusion is, yes, it's going to cost money, but you have to do it. It's morally right to yeah. do it. Uh, and it comes more down to it. And then the question becomes, who's going to pay for it? And you're going to have to pass down the cost of the client, um, which then it's a whole different dynamic. Uh, on yeah, how I mean, we, we, uh, we I from an economic... Sorry, E cubed, which is, uh, you know, sustainability is e, e cubed. It's, it needs to be economically sustainable first, environmentally, and, uh, and, and which is energy as well, and ethically sustainable. Now, what's happened in the last five years plus 
is that the economics are being impacted by the environmental and the energy and ethical piece, right? You're going to get taxed. The stakeholders are demanding it that you need to start doing this. So it, it's becoming more economically viable to do stuff that costs slightly more before. But do you know, I, I think it begs some interesting regulatory questions, though, as well, Chris. You know, I mean, you speak to a lot of people and it is pretty much a viewpoint that hydrogen is going to save the world. Um, but has, has anybody sort of said anything to say off gem? You, you know, because there are gas safety regulations that limit how much you can augment natural gas with hydrogen. And that's the enforcement mechanism from that is the health and safety executive. You know, where's the narrative on it's how we actually again, make... it? <clears throat> Sorry? It's that three-legged stool again, laws of physics, um, regulation yeah. and commercial, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 and why aren't we doing, you know, why aren't we doing things today that would make a real difference? You go to Scandinavia, you can buy HVO at the pump and Volvo, Mercedes, Etoel say, yeah, you're fine to stick it in your diesel car. Um, you know, it's not available in the UK. Um, you, you know, and it, again, it talks to another another issue of, you know, supply and demand. If everybody in the UK suddenly got an electric vehicle, you, we'd collapse the national grid. And uh, Peter, you were saying something. You're going to say something as well. Um, yeah, it, it kind of is, again to the education piece and the way Emma described it um, about you know the association <laughs> with your smartphone and anyone who's you know had a baby um, and sends ridiculous amount of pictures to their parents and their grandparents uh, will appreciate that. Um, I mean, it, it's just an endless. You, no one has awareness. Um, or very few people have awareness of, 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 of just what's going on and, and how what that's doing and uh, what power it's using and and because guess what it's not costing them any more money um, and and I think you know that's a micro level example but I think you know that needs to filter through and if it means you you have you know if it means you tax um, the end user for uh, for that then then so be it, because ultimately, um, and when I say the end user, I mean, the, the data center is frankly just facilitating uh, the demand. Um, people people behave, their behavior chains when it hits their pockets. I mean, it's a very kind of sad thing to say, but that's the reality. So I do think that's the really good example, Emma, of just how to contextualize it um, or a bigger challenge um, at someone's, you know, fingertips. So. I, I guess the thing is, is education sort of informs a choice, whereas tax provides a motivation. Yeah, exactly that. And I think you've got to do the two in hand because, you know, you will, you know, if you, yeah. if you don't know why you're being taxed, you don't understand it, then, uh, um, you know, you don't feel like you. It. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, I think that sounds good. And I mean, and actually just picking up on Emma's point as well about AI and data centers being part of some of the manifestos, there is something they're actually starting to see across Europe now. Um, you see it in, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece, in Italy, uh, whenever there's a bit of elections. We saw it with the EU elections as well was a big part of the conversation um, that they had. But you do have some countries that still lag very much behind on the infrastructure side, talking about the data center, the cell towers, the fiber. They talk about the end use. They don't talk about the infrastructure that makes it happen. Um, and I think in some countries you are seeing infrastructure being built without educating populations. So I think once people start waking up to things a bit more, there might be a future problem that those countries are going to deal with, um, which in a way, I guess, UK and Nordics um, are a bit slightly further ahead in the race of explaining that to people. But there's always a lot of work to be done. Um, but with that said, I'm mean, Chris, Peter, M and Rice. Thank you so much for, for talking to me and joining us for this broadcast. Um, and on behalf of JSA, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, you can also watch our two other half-year sessions on JSA's LinkedIn and YouTube pages, one discuss discussing the growth of innovative revenue streams within the European data center sector, and the other looking at hyperscale data center development in Europe. And with that, we'll wrap up today's conversations. From me and the team at JSA Europe, we hope you have a great summer. See you next time, and as always, happy networking. <laughs>